Any of you have seen the thesis like irresponsibly long or hear that I'm 100% long Solana, whatever it may be, and it sounds like this is a crazy idea. What the fuck is Raoul doing? Isn't he being responsible? But it's not. It's based on an understanding that I'm going to go through why diversification is dead and why concentrated risk-taking in the greatest macro trend of all time is the way forwards, as long as you do it intelligently, which is part of this don't fuck this up thesis of how to do this intelligently. Julian was unfortunately ruined by me. He came as this diversified asset allocation guy. Despite the devaluation of fiat currencies, True Vision founder and CEO Raul Powell believes he can help you get rich faster. Powell, a famous macroeconomics expert and former Goldman Sachs executive, discusses his Everything Code thesis, which links central bank balance sheets, especially the Federal Reserve, and asset prices in a new video on his Raul Pal, the Journeyman YouTube channel. Friend believes the world economy hit a turning point in 2008 that could have been disastrous, but central banks saved it. This was the permanent turning point for the world economy and started a liquidity cycle with four expansion stages. Central bank balance sheets triggered peak reduction in trough. Even though the currency is still falling, Powell believes investors may leverage the government's economic measures to protect and enhance their money. Powell monitors Federal Reserve and other central bank balance sheets. The business cycle is affected by these institutions' constant money printing. Thus, asset prices rise when central banks print money. Powell predicts $400,000 for Bitcoin in 2025, when the liquidity cycle would peak before contracting again and causing the second crypto winter in the video. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, and switch on post notifications for more like this. And how we kind of dovetail is like, as I said, Julian is really king of the business cycle stuff and also has developed a great liquidity framework. You know, my, although I've done business cycle for years, what I've been really good at is the secular thesis and solving the bigger puzzles and how it all fits together. And that kind of magic's come together. And that's what we're going to try and present to you now. So I'm going to kick off this presentation and we'll flip between Julian and I as we go through the bits that that we kind of focus on, even though both of us focus on everything. And I'm trying to stress that this is 30 years of work here. Uh, it's not complete because it's just not enough time because we could probably do four or five hours on the kind of work that we've done. But I think it's going to help you guys a lot in understand the world. And you've seen all bits of it, but you've never seen it all together. So we're going to put it all together now. It's a minus the exponential age thesis. Um, because we just don't have time to go through all of the technological disruption as well. But when I use tech and NASDAQ in the presentation, you can think exponential age as well, although the exponential age should outperform NASDAQ over time. I made this presentation or parts of this presentation recently to a group of family offices. Most people don't realize diversification is dead. Many of you have seen the thesis like irresponsibly long or hear that I'm 100% long Solana, whatever it may be. And it sounds like this is a crazy idea. What the fuck is Raoul doing? Isn't he being responsible? But it's not. It's based on an understanding that I'm going to go through why diversification is dead and why concentrated risk-taking in the greatest macro trend of all time is the way forwards, as long as you do it intelligently, which is part of this don't fuck this up thesis of how to do this intelligently. Julian was unfortunately ruined by me. He came as this diversified asset allocation guy, and he's ended up being a total fucking degen as well, um, because you can't not conclude this. And by the time we go through the presentation, you will get there as well. I'm going to start with a chart that most of you have kind of seen me talk about, and you're going to really understand why it matters. I mean, I tried to put this together in tweet threads. I try and put it together in for ways for you to understand, but this is going to give you the full understanding. Liquidity is everything. It is increasing on a globalized level at 8% a year. This is the global hurdle to all investments that you make. Anything that doesn't beat this is actually making your future self poorer. You can also add in, let's say, 4%, 3 or 4% uh, um, global inflation. So you've got a 12% hurdle rate. That is staggeringly difficult to beat. But if you don't, your asset allocation is going to make your future self poorer. And that is the big deal that we've got. The thesis that I'm about to outline is also based on the fact that 
Once I started digging into the debasement trends, I realized there is two and only two massive secular trends in the world. One is cryptocurrency. This is the log chart of Bitcoin, which over time, as we know, has produced since 2012 alone 20 million percent returns. No asset has ever come close to this in all recorded history. The other mega trend, it's such a beautiful exponential trend, is the NASDAQ. Since 2008, it's been a perfect trend. These are secular trends that are outperforming everything. They're based on adoption curves and technology plus flow of capital because they outperform, they tend to outperform more. But I'll come on to the importance of these, but these are the two key assets that matter to me when I'm talking about portfolio allocation, because everything else, as you'll see, is actually secondary. Raul Powell's thesis has two main parts. The first is that the Federal Reserve and other central banks will continue to print money and asset prices are closely linked to their activities. The second is that while some assets underperform relative to the Fed's balance sheet, others either keep pace or significantly outperform it. Powell uses the NASDAQ and cryptocurrencies as his crystal ball for wealth growth. Crypto and tech stocks can swiftly increase wealth and protect value by keeping up with the Fed's balance sheet. Both asset classes are priced for their cyclicality, which matches the economic cycle and the central bank's four-year debt refinance cycle, which drives global liquidity. Almost poetic PAL also finds minor cycles within each four-year period. Cycles macro spring, summer, fall, and winter liquidity starts rising in spring, which begins a small recovery phase for asset prices. Things really get moving in summer as central banks pump in more liquidity. But fall is when the real magic happens as there are massive injections of liquidity around the world before winter. So how does all this fit into the current crypto cycle? When will asset prices peak and what happens to leading crypto here are more Raul Pal video clips. So let's get into this everything code thesis. You've all heard about it. You understand bits of it. You don't understand all of it for sure. And this is still only part of what we do with the everything code thesis. So at top level, this is the important thing. This is what I call the magic formula. GDP growth equals population growth, productivity growth, and debt growth. So the number of people, if it's growing, your economy grows because there's more people doing economic activity. The more productive they are, the more economic output each person gives. So that's a multiplier. And debt growth is a way of offsetting when these two factors aren't strong enough, you can grow debt. And what happens is the economy grows, but you're robbing the future. So let's go through these in a bit more detail so you can understand how it all dovetails in together. So firstly, here's the trend rate of US GDP. We can observe this in any developed uh, economy around the world, a slowing trend rate of GDP. Over time, economic growth is slowing. Currently, trend rate of growth in the US is 1.75%. So even though we're higher than it now, it oscillates around this. So we should be seeing slower growth over time as trend rate of GDP comes down. But you can have periods where it stays above trend for a bit. But overall, this is like a magnet. It's a magnet because population is slowing down, trend rate of growth. Here's the working age population, which matters. And you can see how much it's slowed from 8% to about 1%. That's a massive slowdown in working age population growth. And even with immigration, you don't get anywhere near the kind of ability to sustain high rates of growth. So growth slows over time. Look at the slope. It's the same kind of slope we saw on the last chart. Then let's talk about debt growth. That's been a big feature of our times. This is the opposite. So as growth has slowed, debt growth has gone up. And the trend of debt growth keeps rising. So total debts in the US is about 370% of GDP. It's staggering. These are staggering amounts of debt, which is the problem the world has gotten into, is we have too much debt considering the amount of GDP that we have. So that creates the big problems that I'll come on to. But, GDP, the, but debt itself has different component parts. The private sector peaked in 2008. So this was the introduction of Basel III. This was tightening of lending standards to households. Households delevered, so they stopped spending as much money on real estate debt and other debts, 
and corporations have become less debt burdensome over time because technology companies don't use debt, while old economy companies, which tend to die over time, tend to use debt. So we've seen a large shrinkage of debt growth. It's still high. It still accounts for 120% of GDP. To put that in perspective, if interest rates were at 2%, let's say, and GDP is at 2% to make easy maths, then servicing just the debt for the private sector takes 100% of GDP growth each year, leaving the government side unfinanceable. That's the real issue we're dealing with here. And so what's happened is the balance sheet, uh, the, um, the debt makeup has changed. It's shifted because you can't get rid of debt so easily. It shifts from one sector to another. And what it's done has been jammed onto the government side of the balance sheet. So the government is taking the strain. And that's a purposeful part because governments have a bit of magic that corporations don't have. And that's called the balance sheet or liquidity. The ability to create money to service your own debt or debasement of currency is something that helps governments run these higher levels. So we've seen this all over the world where the governments are now running the debt and they use liquidity and debasement as a way of financial repression to service it. Another way of seeing this is the interest payments on the debt. So every cycle, and I'll come on to these cycles in a minute, every cycle, they issue new debt. It gets rolled over about three or four years later. When it gets rolled over, there's not enough GDP for the debt that's been added for this cycle. So what happens is they have to inject liquidity or debase the currency to pay for it. If you like this video and want to see more like it, subscribe to my channel and enable post notifications then you should check out Raoul Powell's comprehensive analysis of the Federal Reserve's continuous liquidity loop and the everything code. Leave your thoughts in the comment section below.